so I'm going to start off, I think, by by sort of trying to define what we what I mean when I'm talking about identity politics, because it's one of those things that um, it's kind of like you know you know it when you see it, but um, it's actually quite in many ways quite hard to define. So it seems to me that and obviously there are lots of different, in a sense, understandings of it. It's not like there's sort of one version of identity politics that everybody who um, thinks that's useful follows. But it seems to me that it's kind of a group of, of, of theories and understandings around how, what oppression is and how oppression works. Um, that's based in what it, it, that's based in the identity that you identify with, the identity that you have. So whether you identify as female, you identify as black, you identify as gay, identify as disabled, and and so on. Um, so it's it, it's 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 arguing that that that's the basis on which oppression works, and the way that you fight back against oppression is through thinking about and uh, celebrating your own identity. So it can be. So part of that is that um, owning your identity, talking about your experience, having other people accept your identity and your experience can become then a way of, a, of resisting oppression. So it's very much, I think, around an understanding of that sort of the personal is political. Um, and your personal identity, however you've come by it, you've realised that's what suits you, whatever, is part of, sort of opposing the oppression that you inevitably get because of that identity. Um, and part of this, which is very important, is intersectionality theory. Um, so this is thinking about how the identities uh, combine, because uh, you might be oppressed uh, for one identity. So you might be a woman, and so you're oppressed as a woman, um, but you might also identify as black, so you're oppressed because you're also black. And this is um, uh, the intersectionality theory was uh, thought of by uh, an American called Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who points out that it isn't just sort of arithmetical. You don't just add together, well, today I'm being oppressed because I'm a woman and yes, tomorrow I'll be oppressed because I'm black. Actually, these two things combine. Um, actually, the the image that she used was actually of someone being at an intersection of two roads. Um, so they experience uh, oppression as a black woman, not as kind of two things separately. So that's quite important in, uh, um, in identity politics is this idea of intersectionality and how ide oppressed identities combine. Um, so quite often, I think, as I said, it's, it's, it's quite hard to define. And I think sometimes it can become, it's, it's kind of a term of abuse almost that people don't really think through particularly well. So it gets, it gets thrown around like, a, um, like political correctness does. And it's used sometimes, um, particularly sometimes from the from the mainstream, from the right, as something that um, it's just sort of syno synonymous with left wing. So I was listening to uh, Radio Four last night, and the guy on there was criticising uh, young uh, Black Lives Matter activists, and he said, "Oh, yeah, they're left wing identity politics." And he didn't actually say anything about what they what their politics were that actually sounded particularly like identity politics. They were um, they they were being accused of uh, practicing identity politics because they were demonstrating for Black Lives Matter. So for him, it was kind of they're doing something he doesn't approve of. Therefore, it's identity politics. Um, but what's important to remember um, here is obviously you know this is a this is just sort of silly. But it isn't actually just um, something that the left does. Um, although we tend to think of it as something that sort of left, that um, parts of the left um, have embraced. It's actually, I mean, the right wing uses identity politics as well. So there's a far right group called, for example, called um, Generation Identity, um, who've tried to take up this idea that uh, whatever you identify as is um, is legitimate and you have legitimate reasons to promote it and to get people to accept it and applied it to kind of a white cultural identity. So they talk about white, the white identity as being an oppressed minority in Europe and so on and so on. So they use the language of identity politics to promote their far right, extremely racist ideas. So it's important to remember that it isn't, there's nothing inherently left wing about identity politics, regardless of the politics of some people who, are, uh, who, who use it. So I think, so obviously, um, I think for many people, the that sort of association of, of politics with their own personal identity can seem very powerful. And it kind of is, you know, it's asserting this is a way of opposing oppression just through recognizing your identity and getting other people to accept your identity. So it's kind of you change the world by changing yourself, changing how other people perceive you, but changing how you perceive yourself. And this, so this can feel like, oh, well, it's, you know, you're making a difference just through living every day if you're, um, if you're an oppressed person. So you can see why, pe why people think that this is actually quite helpful. But this does, of course, suggest, I think this gives us the first clue as to the limits of identity politics. Um, because really, it's, 
it arises, I think, from it's basically a politics of defeat. So there's some debate about where the phrase identity politics comes from. So some people have argued that it's the first use of it ever is the Kumbahi River Collective, um, who in the 70s, so I think 1977, people have said that they came up with the term. I don't know whether that's true or not. Possibly people can uh, contradict me in the, uh, in the discussion if you've got other information. But it seems to me really that where it sort of takes off is in the 1980s. So really it's, it's rooted in that sort of period of a downturn for the left when the neoliberalism is, uh, is ascendant and people were feeling very despondent and very defeated and it is very much from that time that it's kind of it's concluding that maybe you can't change the world but what you can do is change your change yourself so um uh siva uh, siva nandan in one of the the suggested readings for this um says this so he paraphrased marx to describe um the approach of identity politics and he said well philosophers have interpreted the world our task is to change the interpretation so he's characterizing identity politics there as saying, well, okay, give up on changing the world, but you can change your consciousness. So it's, it's, it's rooting um, opposing oppression in your head because that's the only place that you have any possibility of, uh, of making change. So it's, uh, so, and because it is that very pessimistic conclusion about whether we can change the world or not, I think this is one of the limitations because it's immediately accepting a major limitation that, okay, oppression is out there, um, exploitation is out there, we can't do anything about this. And what it's done is, is, is really come up with um, an idealist understanding of the world and how and how it works, which is in a sense really again and showing I think it's real, it's real to origins in the 80s, is in a sense a neoliberal idea. So this kind of idea of um, the way that identity politics looks at the world is essentially really going along with the neoliberal idea that there's no such thing as society. You know, the, you know, the Thatcherite phrase, there's no such thing as society, only individuals and their families. And really what identity politics does is effectively saying, yes, well, there's no such thing as society. There's just individuals and the other people in their very specific, who also have their very specific identities. So it's a very atomized way of looking at the world. And so, so if you have, so you have isolated people who all that they can do to improve their lives, to improve, um, to improve the world is change their consciousness and badger the people around them to change their consciousness as well. So this, so, and so I hope that uh, the drawbacks of this idealist approach um, are very apparent. And uh, and Marx, Marx and Engels um, did actually comment on this because idealism is, is, uh, is something that actually has a long pedigree. So they're idealists in the 19th century as well. Uh, so Marx and Engels talked about this in The Holy Family, this idea that you can change the world just by changing your consciousness, changing how you think about things. So they said in The Holy Family, but to rise off your knees, um, in brackets, is, uh, is not in, it is not enough to do so in thought and to leave hanging over one's real sensuously perceptible head, the real sensuously perceptible yoke that cannot be subtilized away with ideas. So their point there is that the problem with idealism is that, yes, you change your consciousness, you feel better about the world, but you haven't actually changed the material reality at all. So you might feel better about the world. People might be more polite to you. They might be using, you know, using the language that you want to use, and that's not nothing. But you haven't actually changed the system of exploitation or oppression at all. So you've changed your consciousness, but you haven't actually made things better. So it's so in Marx and Engels's view, it is um, very limited usefulness because you're not actually changing material con conditions. And we could see there that actually, um, that's it, that if you have um, people thinking, well, we're oppressed in this system, we don't like this, we want to change it. If you are an elite and you want to persuade people to take actions that actually don't, um, that don't upset the way that you're actually running society, encouraging people to just change their minds rather than to fight to change the material conditions might be kind of quite tempting. You might want to do this. So in a way, um, and Stephen Anden talks about this as well, um, certainly in the 80s, um, the kind of actual government uh, programs that really sort of used identity politics um, and sort of celebrated this way of opposing oppression, you can kind of see that this may be deliberate, really, because if you go down an idealist route, you are actually, it says, falling into a trap of missing um, taking on uh, the real material reasons for oppression by thinking that it's all about changing language, changing people's minds and so on um, in this very idealist way. Because the problem with idealism is that you're not 
you're, you're not then having a systemic understanding of oppression. It's not something that's out there. It's something that's that's in that's in your head. So okay, so you could you could say there that okay, I've been quite damning about uh, um, idealism and identity politics as a form of idealism, but you could say that well, surely that isn't a criticism of identity politics per se. All you need to do is make sure that you are actually getting out there and building campaigns on the street, taking on real things, and you could do that on the basis of identity. And indeed, you know. Uh, this, this guy on Radio 4 criticising people for being involved in Black Lives Matter if they do have an identity politics understanding of how racism works but they're getting out there on the street and they're involved in campaigns well is that is that fine then well no because the limits of identity politics go uh, go beyond I think the its roots in idealism and an idealist form of understanding the world to actually having consequences for the ability to build campaigns and actually sort of tactical uh, tactical and strategic issues as well so again if if uh, if you've read the uh, mistaken identity book or the, the review that i did of it on counterfire um that was in the, the suggested reading you'll see that he talks about some fairly specific um strategic and tactical problems that arose in the movements that he was involved in in the states uh, particularly with sort of campus politics from an understanding of um of how you address oppression, specifically racism in the, the case of that book, um, through a sort of an identity politics lens. So the, the example that always stands out to me is that he was involved in a, a campus anti-racist campaign and they were sort of, you know, they were arranging a march and, um, uh, and they were actually seriously going to make people march in different bits of the demo according to how black they were. So they were kind of all black people at the front and then you're Asian, so you go in the middle. And, and obviously this was then a huge route because that is a completely appalling and ridiculous uh, way to organize a campaign. So that was sort of an example, that was sort of one of the things that opened his eyes to this way of thinking about um, how you organize campaigning against oppression is possibly not the best idea. But okay, you could say there, well, that's student politics and people get carried away and make foolish decisions that they wouldn't necessarily do if they had a bit more experience. So. You know, maybe that's a bit of an unfair um, example. This is maybe a par parallel to criticizing uh, left wing councils for say, getting people to sing Barbar Green Sheep or something, you know. So, and I think that sometimes can be, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes you get criticisms for the right of identity politics that pick up those sorts of examples and then don't really do anything with it. They just use it to say all, all lefties are mad. But I think those examples does show, and in fact, that example specifically does indicate one of the, the serious limitations of identity politics, which is where it's understanding that oppression comes from. So as, so as I've said, the thing with identity politics is it doesn't have really a structural analysis of what oppression is and where it comes from. But if it's locating oppression in your, in your mind, so it acts on you because it acts on your consciousness, then identify if you're if you're oppressed because of what you think the identity that you think that you've assumed the identity that you think you have your oppression therefore is what other people think about you it, it's all about whether they accept your identity whether they think your identity is valid and how they treat you and so on so basically oppression therefore isn't in the system in the structures of society in the way that elites uh, run society it's in other people's heads so structurally in in identity politics, other people are the enemy. Anyone who doesn't have your identity, and that can be really quite specific, is therefore by definition one of your oppressors. So it's, it's an incredibly divisive way of understanding how oppression works and how society works. And this is why I think, and there's, there's I think, some, uh, <clears throat> some sensible discussions about uh, about the concept of allyship because you know, people will have come across this that you know if you don't have a particular identity but you want to do something about the oppression that those people face and you know you want to campaign against it and so on well you can be an ally but the problem within this understanding of, of identity politics is that the allyship really it isn't about concretely doing anything so you know to me if you say well you know I say I'm I, I'm not gay, I'm heterosexual, but if I want, you know, as I do obviously support gay people against oppression. So if there's a protest, um, we could say a homophobic attacks concerned, well, I'm an ally. So, I'm, so I, I understand that as well. I'll go along to the protest and I'll, I'll stand beside them and I'll help. But within an identity politics understanding of the world, really my allyship isn't really about that. It's about apologizing for my innate homophobia, which I must have because I'm not gay. 
So it becomes, so allyship becomes rather than something that's about building solidarity, it's about, so in a sense, making everyone apologize who doesn't have that particular oppression. And this again is not a way of actually building any sort of solidarity. It's an incredibly divisive uh, a way of understanding uh, how, so how society works. So, so that's, so it makes, so it is structurally very, very difficult therefore to build any sort of political solidarity. And it also means, therefore, that you don't have any way of deciding, well, which campaign is more important on a particular date, what, what, are, the, you know, what are the priorities for opposing oppression, except by kind of trying to work out who else, who is the most oppressed at any given point, and therefore who, desi who deserves allyship more than, more than others. So this is where, I mean, people, if people ever um, spend, as I do, far too much time reading other people's comments on Twitter, you'll have come across the phrase oppression Olympics, which is bandied around a lot. And this is where you know, people seem to be sometimes being in the competition for who's more oppressed. And, you know, sometimes it just seems like this is just people being silly on social media. But I think that the reason why people keep doing this is because within an identity politics understanding of oppression, there really isn't another way of deciding, well, what's a priority at any given moment, except for a competition about who's more oppressed. So that, so that sort of oppression Olympics is actually part of the structure of how identity politics understands the world. And it does set a different identities against each other. And this can be quite deliberate, as I, as I mentioned before, the sort of government in the 80s deliberately actually ad adopting approaches that fracture the sort of black political identity into Pakistanis competing for resources against Bangladeshis and so on that, that Stephen Andon talks about. Um, but it can be just something that people do themselves because it arises from, uh, from, uh, from an identity politics view of the world that you are in competition against each other and the one who is most oppressed therefore is the one who deserves everyone else's um, allyship. And we can see that because of that way that it does provide this very divisive understanding, that actually struggles can be oppressed against each other. So there are very, various examples um, where, for example, sort of uh, actual you know, sexism, in a sense, was was used uh, as was 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 used. Um, because sorry, I'm getting this. I'm getting this the wrong way around. The example that I'm thinking of was um, the sort of Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill case, where uh, he was a, a Republican judge, a black a Republican judge who um, who's accused of sexual harassment, and and he said, oh, it's racist to accuse me of sexual harassment, even though Anita Hill was also black, and that was kind of, and she was she was quite widely criticised uh, for betraying um, blackness by criticising a black judge. So it was kind of like you double down on the sexism to. Um, to make an anti-racist point. So, it, so an identity politics understanding of how oppression works allows you to do that because it's setting oppressions off against each other. So they can be co-opted. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of underlining how this, uh, this ultimately is a really divisive way of understanding oppression. Okay, so you could say, and I realize I was going on quite, so I have to speed up a little bit. You could say that, you know, lefties, take this view of identity politics sometimes because we don't want to take oppression seriously. So this is a criticism that has been leveled sometimes with some justification against parts of the left, that we're only interested in economic exploitation um, and basically oppression just has to wait till after the revolution. So, you know, if you're suffering discrimination now because you're black or because you're a woman or because you're gay, then you just have to wait. We'll sort it all out once we sort it, once the victory of the proletariat is at hand. Um, and as I said, you know, sometimes when um, you look at that, you could kind of think that, yeah, well, maybe that's a fair point, like say of the left in the, in the 60s not taking women's oppression seriously and so on. Um, so sometimes the way that uh, the people try to overcome this um, is by saying that well we'll include class as, as another identity. So if you identify as working class then we'll add you to the oppression Olympics and see if that scores you enough points uh, to, to be up the, uh, up the table. And the problem with this, of course, is that what that's doing, if you include class as an identity, what you're talking about then is um, people's understanding of what, of what class they are in a kind of a cultural sense. So it's whether you identify as working class or not, for example. Whereas of course, as Marxists, we understand that class is not about what's in your head, what you think you are. And it's not about sort of cultural signifiers. You know, it's not about whether you call what you wipe your mouth with after eating a napkin or a serviette. You know, that's, that's, that's not what's important. What's important about class is your relation to capital 
So if you have to sell your labor in order to live, then you are a proletarian, regardless of what you think you are. And if you actually control capital, then you are a member of the bourgeoisie. Again, regardless of whether you like to go on about how you were born in the council house and so on, if you have attained that level of power and uh, actual proximity to actual capital, then you are bourgeois, regardless of how many H's you drop. So, and, and, that, and that happens regardless of what you think and what anyone else thinks, it's just a material fact. And if we don't understand that as a material fact, then we don't understand how exploitation is working and we can't therefore fight it. So including class as another, just another identity really doesn't get around this problem of, of how you understand exploitation and oppression and how they relate. Because it seems to me that at the bottom of the, the problem with identity politics, and, and I think one of the main reasons why it doesn't really help us in addressing oppression, is it doesn't understand how, how exploitation and oppression relate. And, and you know, and this, this can seem quite difficult. And I think an awful lot of people talk about oppression, even people who aren't actually following someone identity politics line, as if it's kind of completely separate from exploitation. Like there's two shitty things that happen to human societies and they just happen to happen to the same ones. And what, that, what that's completely missing is that oppression is part of exploitation. It doesn't exist separately. There have never been human societies that didn't have class, but did have oppression. Oppression comes from the class system. So as we all know, because we've all read our angles, um, a women's oppression arises from the establishment of class as part of the establishment of class. It's part of the point. It's part of how that system works. And the reason why it, that it's part of how that system works is to do with obviously development of property and so on. But the function of it is to be divisive. It's to give some people a little bit of a stake in the system. So even though they're, they're exploited, they're part of the oppressed class, they have a little bit of a reason to stay loyal to the ruling class rather than going, well, this sucks. We're not going to put up with this. So that, that was, they, that's the function of oppression. And it's something that we can see, we can see historically because so we don't have an awful lot of uh, written evidence, of course, uh, for the development of class and development of women's oppression. But for racism, we do, because racism is a much, much more recent construct. And we can see actually how um, elites in, the, in feudal Europe and then to in the transition to capitalism are encouraging racism and using racism as a way of giving marginal privilege to some white people so that they have a reason they have a stake in the system and as a way basically of dividing the the proletariat no the emergent proletariat because it because oppression is part of exploitation so it, they're not two completely separate systems they're not actually on separate axes in the sense in the way that sometimes we talk about them um, and i think once we understand oppression as uh, a tool of exploitation it becomes much easier to understand how we need to uh, to fight it because what we need to understand is that identity politics is really just accepting the system that is set up for us by by the form of exploitation that we're living under you know it's that is divide that's dividing us and ex and identity politics is saying well okay we are divided so how can we fight for our few people our individual and their household individual and their identity so it's kind of it's it's a struggle that is entirely within the limits that are set for us by neoliberalism and what i think a marxist understanding of how these things into actually interrate gives us is that we do not have to accept that and actually, we, it's not that we say, OK, well, we'll wait till after the revolution and then there won't be sexism and racism anymore. But what understanding how these things relate tells us is that we have to oppose those collectively. It has to be part of a collective struggle and it has to be with an understanding that allows us to have solidarity. It's not just individuals campaigning for their own interest. It's all of us saying, well, none of us want to put up with sexism and with racism and with homophobia. And therefore, we are all going to campaign against them whenever that's necessary. And the priorities will come from tactical strategic considerations, what will actually have the best chance of success at any given moment, rather than who's most oppressed in a kind of, in that sort of competition, because actually we all care about these things, regardless of whether we are personally subject to them or not. So that I think is that, and if, if I think we can, we can win that argument that this needs to be collective. I think that's really transformational. And I think often it is one on the streets. I mean, after all, you know, if you, when you, uh, when you read you know, arguments about, you know, things around Black Lives Matter campaigning and so on in social media, it all seems very divisive. But when you come together on the streets, actually it's suddenly much more simple that you all stand to get, you're all standing together against this particular, the, the, this oppression in this moment, because that's the right thing to do. But I think that, 
the way that identity politics means that it's not possible to have that really strong collective solidarity is I think the major limit of identity politics and why I think we should be prepared to argue comradely uh, with people who think that that's how to understand oppression that actually it's not helpful. Uh, if we also if we all stand together without worrying about who identifies as what really that's the best chance of success so i'll leave it there <laughs>